And I want to start out words of an old gospel song that come to my mind. In this old world in which we dwell, ever man must choose between heaven and hell as a final resting place for his poor soul. Get a free grace ride to where Jesus dwells or a one-way trip to devil's hell. Up to you, man, which will be your goal. Now you may stop and meditate which of these roads you'll take, but that's no problem. Here's a reason why. There's a Holy Bible for you to read and a Holy Spirit for you to heed. Better get right with the Lord before you die. Well, that's pointed toward evangelism. And our subject is restoring New Testament evangelism. Years ago, I made the acquaintance of Charles Allen. Charlie Allen was a denominational preacher. I think he preached to the largest Methodist church in North America at that time. Uh, he was pretty much of an old revivalist. Charles Allen was a great author. He wrote God Psychology, Touch of the Master's Hand, a bunch of other books that were just great and still in print today. We were talking, and he said to me, Now, Brother Merrill, uh, what is the goal of the brotherhood that you are a part of? And I said, well, our goal is to restore the New Testament church. He then made a statement that called for a lot of self-examination. He looked at me, and he said, uh, Which church in the New Testament, Brother Merrill? I hope it's not the one in Corinth. Well, I thought a while, and I tried to explain that we were not reformers, we were restorationists, and we stood for the ideals and the principles and the structure of the church as we find it in the New Testament. He was concerned about that, and uh, in a very respectful way, said that was needed in the world, and he thought it was a great idea. He was up in years at that time. But I got to thinking about that as I went out, and I thought, you know, we are restorationists, but we still owe a great deal to those who started what we would call the Protestant Reformation. There were attempts to uh, reform the Roman Catholic Church from about the year 1100 A.D. to about 1500, but most of those attempts fell by the wayside. It wasn't until Martin Luther tacked his 95 thesis to the chapel door of the Wittenberg Castle that something really started to happen. Those 95 things were errors that he picked out in the Roman Catholic Church, things that did not agree with the Bible. But I want you to realize something. He wrote those and put them on the door in Latin, as far as we know. And only the churchmen of the day knew Latin. Martin Luther had intended to live and die as a Roman Catholic theologian. It was when they ejected him from the church and branded him a heretic, and those 95 theses were put in vernacular German and widely publicized, it was then that people protested, and the Protestant Reformation was on the scene, but he was a reformer. Now, some of our early fathers of the Restoration Movement were probably more reformers at first than Restorationists. After all, they were men who were in transition. We think of James O'Kelly. He started the Republic Methodist Church in 1793 in North Carolina. He started that because he was fed up with the structure of the Methodist Church and some of its practices. At his first association meeting a year later, they were talking about the creed of the church, and Rice Haggard suggested, why don't we just abide by Acts chapter 11, verse 26, and just call ourselves Christians. At the same time, a man by the name of Hafferty said, why just we don't, don't we just declare the Bible only as the creed of the church? And the light of restoration began to dawn. However, we have to realize that James O'Kelly 
was pretty solidly locked into infant baptism and sprinkling. And while he did begin to separate himself from that, we have no hard evidence, in my opinion, that he ever separated himself completely from it. But he did have the light of restoration. Martin Stone came on the scene. And I love the declaration and address by Thomas Camel. But I think one of the greatest documents ever written was when Barton Stone wrote the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery because he realized that you could not be denominational and please Jesus Christ. And they met and talked about the Bible alone, and suddenly a man spoke up. His name was Rice Haggard. He said, why don't we just call ourselves Christians in accordance with Acts 11.26? And that carried. And they talked about Christians only and the creed of the church being the Bible only. You know, I wonder about this guy, Rice, Rice Haggard. He suddenly appears in North Carolina with a very timely comment and suggestion. And then suddenly he's in Kentucky with a very timely comment and suggestion. And how did he get from North Carolina to Kentucky? That was a long way in that day. And I wish I knew more about Rice Haggard, but that man is a part of the providence of God, I am sure. At any rate, the Restoration Movement came into being. But what was the first the first major disagreement. First major disagreement in our movement was over types of evangelism. The camp meetings were popular. The revivalism of the eight, early 1800s. Some of them disagreed with the emotional impact of those revivals. I think it's interesting that Barton Stone would never claim that you had to have the jerks or the barking or the supernatural singing or any of that stuff to be a Christian, but he did look upon those things as manifestations of God. And so there was great disagreement over what evangelism was to be like, but they agreed on the necessity of it, and a wave of evangelism swept over the frontier, and we came into being as a brotherhood. Now, the concept of restoring the New Testament church means that we have to restore the concept of a growing church. We have to restore the concept of the need of evangelism. And that mindset must once again be established in our churches. So I have five or six things that I want to say about New Testament evangelism. First of all, New Testament evangelism made much of edification. They were passionate about the winning of souls, but they were also passionate about grounding them in the Scripture and nurturing them and discipling them. Colossians 2, the 6th and 7th verses. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. That's nurture. That's discipling. I heard a guy say once in a lecture, I would rather win 50 people and lose 25 than win two and lose one because the difference is 24 conversions. There's something right about that and there's something very wrong about it too because he was thinking of it just in terms of decisions. I want to go back to the early days of what we call the church growth movement. And one of the foundations of the church growth movement was a law at that time that read like this. The church must look upon evangelism not as just decisions for Christ, but as discipleship. And that still holds true. We need to resurrect that law. I joke at Wayne Smith a lot, but uh, many years ago I was holding a revival at Southland Christian Church in Lexington. He was a minister, and the church was just getting into its growth period. 
they were running about 700 in attendance, and I got in the office one morning and started going over statistics. I was amazed to find out that their attendance was much, much larger than their membership. Of course, I realized that uh, the factor of children must be included. There were a lot of young married couples that had children, children that were too young to accept Christ as Savior, but they were in the attendance, you know. But then as I began to look, I came to the conclusion that there were no years in the history of the church up to that time when they had what I would call a phenomenal number of baptisms or transfers, probably just about average. Uh, they did a good job of reaching people. But the thing that I saw was that the loss through the back door was far smaller than most churches that I ever checked out because they did such a good job of being concerned about people and discipling them and nurturing them. You see, we call that edification. Edification means to grow the person, to enlighten the person. We call it edification, and it can come in several ways. I'm going to mention four. Number one, it can come just by caring. We take a long step toward edification and discipleship when we just love and encourage people. It can come second by Christian education. Christian education is always a major factor, whether it's by Sunday school or new members' classes or home studies or all of the many ways we have it. The Bible does the job. I think a third way is by involvement. I have tried shepherding programs I have never been able to make them work very well, very long. The best shepherding program I have at Harvester Christian Church is involvement. We don't lose involved people. We make every effort to get them involved. In fact, I say to them quite often, I hope I say it a little more tactfully that I'm going to say it right now, but I let them know that if they will not get in a Sunday school class or a home study, and get involved in a ministry, they are really saying to us, you just go ahead and try to disciple us, but you won't be able to do it. And I just about put it that way. Involvement is a great shepherding program. People grow also in involvement. But then building relationships is a fourth way. The Bible talks about fellowship. And there's no real fellowship without relationships among Christians. I think it ought to be a priority in every program we have in the church. But you have to admit, the whole idea of edification is very prominent in all the New Testament epistles. And so real evangelism included edification. Second, New Testament evangelism was a top priority. They were not only concerned about the whole being of the person, but they were concerned about that being the focus of the church. You can go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Just before Jesus ascended to heaven, he said to his followers, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He wants all of us to be witnesses. He wants all of us to be co-laborers. Quite a thought. And so New Testament evangelism was the top priority. Wherever these people went, they witnessed, and the early church had an impact on the known world and changed it drastically within 40 years. Now we come to the Great Commission. And that was read in a very fine way. But we are told to go to all the world and preach the gospel and baptize the believers and continue to teach them. And evangelism is the focus of that. The church I serve does not have a mission statement. I know that it's popular to have mission statements, and I certainly are for them, and I want you to know I am not against them. And some churches have very well-written mission statements. But the elders of the church I serve said, what's wrong with the Great Commission? It's about the best mission statement we think we can find. 
and we just leave it that way. Evangelism is its focus. And when we cease to be concerned about evangelism, we have lost our first love. And when we cease to preach evangelism, we are failing to reach. And when we fail to try to evangelize ourselves, we are not setting in the right example or setting the right example. Got in trouble at a Bible college years ago. Real trouble. Never been invited back. But I made the statement, I said, I think that if you have gone a month and have not made an attempt to win somebody to Christ and talk to them about your soul, I think you are backslidden, whether you are a college professor or a student, I think you are backslidden. That didn't go over too well. And so, you know what? I still believe it and I still keep saying it. We have to witness. We have to evangelize. We have to set the example. I uh, got to laughing the other day. I was in a seminar, and I had some denominational preachers present. They were, a, they were a very talkative after the service, and they told me that in one large church in their denomination, they have removed all computers from staff offices. They have a computer that they can go to when they need one but they've removed them because they said all we see is a bunch of people sitting in front of computers and no one out talking to people about their soul. It's a thought. I don't know whether I'm going to do that or not, but I tell you, it seems like we have lost the focus of the priority of evangelism. See, uh, we have to teach people there's something to be saved from that there is only one way to be saved from it. And that thing we're saved from is hell and the consequences of sin. And we are saved by being in Jesus Christ and there is no other plan. We're saved by grace. Now wait just a minute. I uh, heard Florence Litauer speak to a group of women not long ago. I got in the wings and waited because I wanted to hear her. And she told of speaking in a place uh, previous to that where she had a crowd of women. She was talking about grace, and she said, Can any of you define grace? And everything was quiet. And she said, Finally, there was a little six-year-old girl dressed up like you would never expect a child that age to be dressed up. And she was right on the front row, and she just suddenly stood up. And Florence said, Well, honey, do you know what grace is? And she said, grace is unmerited favor. And Florence said, I was surprised at the maturity of her answer until I said, well, now, honey, what does that mean? And the little girl said, I haven't a clue, and sat back down. <laughs> I sometimes wonder if we have a clue. Grace is something we have to have, but it's something we don't deserve. And Christ paid the price on the cross to give it to us. And there are elements of the biblical plan of salvation that have been preached wonderfully well. Biblical faith and biblical repentance and biblical confession of faith and biblical baptism. Our former speakers have covered those. But it's Christ who saves. And we have to come to him his way. And we have to appropriate that grace through the obedience to the gospel and we are added to his body, the church. New evangelism, New Testament evangelism, saw that as the top priority. There's a third thing. New Testament evangelism will always take a worldview. Jesus told us the gospel was for the whole world. Now, wait a minute. The early history of our movement made much of foreign missions, and they did a pretty good job for their day. Today, we have to realize we have about three times more members outside North America as we have inside North America. We're doing a pretty good job on evangelism compared to other groups, but it's difficult to keep the balance. Here's what I see going on. I see a lot of churches, sometimes smaller churches, that give a large proportion of their budget to missions 
but they aren't doing anything to evangelize their own area. And their missionary giving can be a substitute. The giving of money, see, can become a substitute for local evangelism. On the other hand, I see some larger churches that are so concerned about their own programming that they give very little to missions and that selfishness and unconcern. And I think we wrote, walk a tightrope in this, and we have to be careful. But a world that is loved by God and which Jesus died for, well, we're disobeying the Great Commission if we don't use missions, if we don't support them. On the other hand, if we don't do the job in our own community, then we are not witnessing for Christ very well as a local body or by individuals. That is a tightrope to walk. Examine yourselves on that. Ah, fourth, New Testament evangelism was often directed to the masses. Jesus preached to crowds. There was a crowd at the Sermon on the Mount. There was a crowd when he got out in Peter's boat and spoke to them. There was a crowd at the feeding of the 5,000. There was a crowd when Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost. Paul, on his missionary journeys, often spoke to crowds. Our movement started with the camp meeting crowds, and they were great crowds for their days. Right after World War II was over, we grew, and we had mass evangelism. I started out in the days of the great revival crowds. Now, I don't know how many it takes to make a crowd. I know that many of our churches today are crowded. They're going into multiple services. They are multi-siding, and there's a lot of church planting going on. And by the way, if you're not involved in church planting, you better take another look at your, at your passion. Because you see, in some areas, church planting is our only hope. Church planting is reaching more new people for Christ than anything else in our movement. And yet we get selfish about it. Uh, we started a new church in Troy, Missouri, just a year ago. A uh, staff member just went up there and said, Ben, you want a church in Troy? I said, you bet I do. He said, well, give me a month. And I said, you can't start a new church in a month. He started it in two weeks. Had its first anniversary not long ago. Had over 100 people, the, uh, running over 100 people right now, and we didn't give them any from our congregation because they were too far away, 28 miles through the country. But we support it. But you know what happened? Another little church across nearby. Absolutely, completely upset because we were starting a new church in an area that has about 2,000 new people a year moving into it. Absolutely upset. We were in competition with them. Their average attendance is 16. I don't get it. You know, if you want to come to where I live and start a new church within a mile of us, and that's happening at one of our sites, I don't care. There's enough people around to be one. It'd be like two ants fighting over who's going to eat an elephant. Listen. That's an aside. Lee, this doesn't count against my time. That's an aside. <laughs> we are leading in church planting right now. I don't know whether you know it or not. There was a time this time last year when we were averaging starting about six new churches a week. And I haven't any statistics to help me out with what's going on right now. But we're being recognized as having expertise in church planting. But the greatest church planting, I think, is when one congregation will just go out and start another one. Oh, I'm for the organizations, but we've just got to get busy on this. Well, anyway, I'm off track. My idea is that New Testament evangelism was directed toward the masses. We are gone through a time, I think, when the thing has been worship evangelism, people coming to church, hearing the gospel, being one to Christ. 
I want us to do the best we can do in planning services, the best we can do in preparing to preach. I want to do, use every honest and right me method to get people in position to hear the gospel, but I also want you to see that fifth of all, New Testament evangelism was done by personal work. You go to Acts chapter 8, the fourth verse. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. You have to admit that that bad persecution caused a good thing to happen with the church. They were scattered and they evangelized. The church grew in the realm of personal evangelism. Paul said in Acts 20 and verse 20, You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. Paul believed in mass evangelism. He believed in personal evangelism. I deal with a group of men in the church growth movement that uh, talk about indicators. And about all of them are sold on the fact right now that the next wave in the future is going to surprise us. It's going to be a wave of personal evangelism. But it won't be the high pressure kind that I grew up in ministry with. Man, I know I baptized some people that found it a whole lot easier to be baptized than to be called on every Tuesday night. And that was kind of high pressure evangelism. I think we're going to see people taught to witness, taught to articulate the gospel in a casual setting, they will be inviters, and they will grow in Christ and become decision-getters, but it will be more of a conversational evangelism. But I want to warn you about something. It is not going to work in your church unless you have the kind of church and services that would make them want to invite other people to them. That sentence is quite a mouthful. That is not my manuscript, incidentally, but... Uh, I'm saying simply that if your services are dead, if there's no unity in the church, they're not going to invite. No, I'm not saying you have to have church services that are a great show or an entertainment blast. But I am suggesting two things. I'm suggesting that we make church services as good as we can possibly make them. You know, I've watched people and sometimes we just get sloppy in church. Now, your excellence may not be as excellent as the excellence of a nearby church, but it can still be your excellence. When I started at Harvester Christian Church, we ran about 140 people, 160, and we had the worst church services I'd ever set in, and the people were wonderful. They had to be put up with it. And um, we actually started going down on Saturday evening and uh, rehearsing a little bit of it. And we didn't rehearse the service completely. We walked through it so that everybody involved knew where they were supposed to be and what they were supposed to do. And the sound man, who is still in sound, cornered me after about three weeks of this. He said, what are we trying to do? Just trying to pull off a slick service? And I complimented him. I said, you know, Bob, you are very perceptive. I have gone for years watching people rehearse two weeks to sing before 20 old men at the Rotary Club, and then they'll come in church and slop through anything in front of 200 people, and I'm not going to have it. The Lord deserves the best. He decided I was right, and I think I am right. So do whatever you can do with excellence, but then I want to talk about preaching and teaching. Because you see, if preaching and teaching is bitter and constant fault-finding and filled with sarcasm, those downers will keep people from inviting others. Now, good things are taking place, and I'm not saying that we can't preach against sin and false doctrine but we can always do it with positive alternatives, and i got to close this. 
I think the last thing is that New Testament evangelism must be accompanied by good works. Now, after hearing last night's sermon on prayer, I felt that uh, I left that out. There can be no real evangelism without prayer. But there can be no real evangelism that is not accompanied by good works. Uh, in the New Testament church, they help people. They met their needs. Uh, next, after preaching the gospel, was always to remember the poor. And I think there is an unwritten law of evangelism that we need to remember. And I put it this way, it's my way, that the leadership of the church must endeavor to put the church in a situation that is conducive to receiving the blessings of God. And when we begin helping people, we are suddenly in a situation that is conducive to receiving God's blessings. Now, as you go through the book of Acts and you go through the epistles, the church did this. Check up on your attitude. Is your attitude, we are a church, and since we are a church in this community, this community ought to cater to us? Or is your attitude, we are a church and we are the body of Christ, and we're going to do something to help in this community? There's all the difference in the world in those two attitudes, but a word of caution in closing. You may not win the people you help. We have a huge benevolent program where I serve, and we win only a small percentage of the people you help. I'd like to win more of them, but we help them because they need help, and they have kids, and that's extended God's grace, and you can't extend God's grace and separate it from generosity. Generosity and grace go together, so we help them. But you know who you win? You win the people that want to be a part of a church that's helping people. That's who you win. And they come and they are one to Christ. And I could keep you here the rest of the day telling you stories about that. But it works. No, this is not social gospel. This is the things that accompany salvation that we read about in the book of Hebrews. So evangelism is a complex study. But I think if you restore these six things in your local congregation, you'll be well on the way to it. I was uh, preaching in Bright Brighton, England two years ago. I don't know what happened to me. I had a chance to go to the World Convention, and I didn't have very high expectations when I went. And it didn't even begin to come up to those expectations. So I was very unimpressed. I was invited to give a couple of workshops, and uh, I don't think anybody even grasped what I talked about in evangelism. Uh, I think a lot of them felt that the whole idea was undignified. But then I was invited to speak to all of the men. And... Uh, we went into a, a big dining area in the convention center in Brighton, England, and had a meal, but it was the poorest speaking situation that any speaker could ever have. And there was an Australian guy that was kind of in charge. And he came around to me and he said, Now, brother, I am not going to have you speak in this situation. He said, I'm going to have him go through that door where there's a hall, as he put it, all set up with chairs, and we'll just sit down, and you'll have a better speaking situation. Well, one of the aides in the convention center said we couldn't do that. And he said, oh, ma'am, we can. He said, all we have to do is walk through that door and go in there. I said, we can do it. She said, but you're not allowed to use that. And he said, I don't know why we've rented the convention center, and he just led us on through. God bless Australians. I had a wonderful place to speak in and some great music, and uh, I spoke on this idea of uh, don't lose the wonder of communion with God through prayer 
and Bible study and the Lord's Supper and don't lose a wonder of Christian service. We're co-laborers. Don't lose a wonder of conversion. I was highly criticized by some European preachers when it was over. They accused me of starting to try start a revival. Brother, if anyone needed it, they did, and uh, I was trying to start that all right. But again, blood bless the Australians. They moved in, and uh, they just told them. And there was a good argument going on between the Australians and the Europeans on about my sermon. In fact, they never knew when I left. It was still going on. But I left with this thought. Every denomination or brotherhood has been born in the flame of evangelism. And after about three generations, loses that passion. And when you lose the passion for evangelism, liberalism on the Bible follows. And we don't want that, do we? So let's get back to evangelism. You got the point. <laughs> 